Good afternoon, and welcome to the Janus Forum's third lecture series event of the year, Hip Hop, featuring Dr. Michael Eric Dyson and Dr. Boyce Watkins. My name is Anish Sarma. I am one of the co-directors of the Janus Forum, a group of undergraduates dedicated to promoting open, honest, and civil discourse about topics important to students and to citizens in our community. I would like to take this moment to thank a few people who made this particular lecture possible. First, the Janus Foreign Steering Committee, uh, composed of representatives from various campus political organizations who, in the long tradition of Brown students taking ownership of their educations, devised this lecture, the prompt, chose the speakers, and helped make this all happen. And of course, the Political Theory Project, for whose resources, advice, and trust we are always grateful. In addition, I'd like to welcome our guests from Miami University and the distinguished high school debaters from the Rhode Island Urban Debate League who are here to join our conversation today. And all of you, of course. So let's move to the topic at hand, uh, hip hop. We're going to be hearing from uh, Dr. Watkins first. He'll speak for 20 to 25 minutes and then Dr. Dyson will do the same. And then there will be a, uh, an extended Q&A period for all of you to engage and really hold their feet to the fire, so I know we're all looking forward to that. Um, briefly, let me introduce the speakers. Uh, Dr. Watkins is a scholar in residence at Syracuse University, founder of YourBlackWorld.com, and the author of several books, including, I cannot read my own handwriting, uh, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About College, A Guide for Minority Students, and What If George W. Bush Was a Black Man. Dr. Michael Eric Dyson is a professor of sociology at Georgetown and also the author of several books, including Come Hell or High Water, Hurricane Katrina, and The Color of Disaster. And he recently edited a book called Born to Use Mics, Reading Nas is Illmatic. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Watkins. What's happening, Brown University? How are we today? I'm pretty pumped to be here. You know, the weather's nice. I'm from Syracuse, where it snows in your living room. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's been real interesting talking to the students here. And uh, I'm excited about the fact that you are excited about this topic, uh, because this topic's very important to me. Uh, I, I, I know it's very important to my brother, uh, Professor Dyson, uh, who I have a lot of respect for. And I, I will say this to the day that I die, that actually the reason that I became a public intellectual was because of him. I saw this man on TV in 1997, and I said, yo, that's what's up. I want to do that. So without him, I wouldn't be standing here. I'd be standing somewhere else. So where do we start when we talk about hip hop? How do we even begin this conversation? Well, at first I have to start off by making a confession. I have a confession. I love hip hop music. Now, I'm not talking about old school stuff. I'm not talking about just, you know, the hip, the hop, the hibbity, the hibbity. No, 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 I'm talking about new stuff. You know, T.I. is my favorite artist. Not just of this time, but of all time. I know his lyrics. Me and my kids, we sit in the car, and we, we, start, you know, we just start busting and be like, you know, rarely out my element, barely out the ghetto with, one for that and one for the intelligent as fellas get. Like, we do all of that, right? Listen, let's settle this. Be clear. I could fall back seven years, still ain't the one ahead of me. Like, I know the lyrics, right? So, so really, to, to confront hip-hop, to really talk about what's going on in hip-hop, it, it's kind of a, an awkward kind of conversation. It's sort of like, you know, telling your, your brother that he's had too much to drink and that he doesn't need to get behind the wheel. Or, or, or talking to a, a relative about a drug addiction that is causing them to uh, make decisions that are not good for themselves or their family. And so it, it, it hurts. It's, it's real hard. It's real hard to talk about it because when you talk about it, you get attacked, you get criticized. When, when you critique on any level, people say, oh, well, you're being too serious, you're, you're going too far. And, 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 and the thing about it, though, the thing that's very interesting is that you can't live in the space that we live. You can't see the things that we see. You can't see the things that, that I've seen in the hood on a regular basis and not understand the impact that artist irresponsibility is having on 
young kids. When, when the, the, the little boy that, that my daughter babysits got shot in the head by a young thug, I, I thought about the influence of the culture and what that did to create this, 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 this person who had transformed himself into a monster that society had turned into a monster. And, and of course, it's not just the music. We know that, right? We know that there are, are, are a, a myriad of, of sociological systemic factors that played a role in, in, in the creation of this, this person that shot a three-year-old in the head. But at the same time, you have to confront that. You can't just sit back and sort of say, well, it is what it is. You can't listen to an artist like Lil Wayne and just say, Nah, it's just music, it's just entertainment. No, that, that, that's, that's not what it is. It's, it's a lifestyle, it's marketing a product. You know, I, I'm a business school professor, we know all about marketing and getting people to, to, to recite mantras and that, that, that sink into their subconscious. In fact, Lil Wayne, I, 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 Lil Wayne is another interesting cat because, because, see, I hate him because I love him. I, I hate him because his music is so good that you can't help but to like it. You know, I, in fact, I, I hate him for the same reason that Eddie Long used to talk about gay people, because he, he liked gay people. Well, you know, it, it's the same way. You know, I like Lil Wayne's music. I know the lyrics, and I listen to them. I've analyzed them. And, and in fact, Lil Wayne is probably the most powerful mega pastor in America. He's just preaching the gospel of ignorance and self-destruction. And kids are eating it up. When he raps about killing little babies and walking into your house and shooting your grandmother up and saying things that are just blatantly irresponsible, people eat that up. Little kids are hearing this. They're absorbing these messages. In fact, I, I, I remember hearing a song where he talked about how he could take your girl and make her, I can make her kill for me and steal for me and slut for me and nut for me and then I'll, I'll murder that bitch and send her body back to your ass. That's what he said. Now, excuse my French, but I'm repeating what these artists are saying because I think we need to start from the foundation of truth. We can't talk about this and sugarcoat it. It's real. When we hear Tyler, the creator, uh, the artist who said that I'll, I'll rape a pregnant bitch and tell my friends I had a threesome, what you're seeing is artists testing the limits. They're seeing how far they can go. They're saying, wow, people, people the, more, they, they, the, the more outrageous I get, the more they love what I say. You hear Wiz Khalifa just casually on 106 in Park on BET, a show that markets to teenagers singing a song about how he's sloppy drunk looking for the keys to his car. You see Too Short on the cover of Double XL magazine. Too Short's an OG. He's old like me, and I've, I've, I've seen his music evolve for many, many years. And I'm going to tell you this, he don't need to be given fatherly advice. But that's what he was doing. On Double XL, they gave fatherly advice from Too Short on how you can, as a 14-year-old boy, go past trying to get kisses from girls. You can get straight to the hole if you push her up against the wall and put your hand down her pants. And, 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 and these guys, I'm mentoring the young artists that are coming along. Too Short is on the Wiz Khalifa track that was performed on BET 106 in part. So how can you sit and watch all of this as a black man and not stand up and say something? and deal with this. When you look at artists, and, and this is what, what's really amazing to me about hip hop. Again, hip hop, I see this also through the lens as a, a businessman, right? As a business school professor, and I see the genius of many of these artists. I, I see 50 Cent, who is a brilliant, brilliant businessman. And what's so interesting is, I remember one time 50 Cent gave an interview with The New Yorker. And it was, it was, it was so brilliant. He talked about stocks and bonds and portfolios and asset allocation and branding and, and all these other things that he had to do to become a successful businessman. But then he goes over to Double XL and does an interview. It's all about flossing and stunting and, and, and wearing diamonds and, and, and how many women he's got and how big his gun is and all this ignorant crap. So I thought this is interesting. When he's talking to the rest of America, he's talking about things that are productive that will lead him to be successful. But when he comes to us, he gives us the crap. Just like slavery. Some people ate the good food. Black people were fed the scraps. And the thing is that, as a professor, we, we understand how education kind of works. And one of the things I think is so true, and if you don't understand this, I hope you know this after you walk out of here, that most of the education that you receive during college is going to happen outside the classroom. You see, the, the, the classroom sort of gets you started. It teaches you how to think. but it doesn't give you everything you need in order to survive in this world. So most of your education happens outside the classroom. And artists are also professors. 
just like little Wayne's a mega pastor. And I was sitting there thinking, I was like, okay, if I'm a little kid, what, what lessons am I getting from my professors that I'm hearing on the radio every day? Okay, number one, I'm hearing that I want to consume drugs and alcohol as much as possible. I want to stay high and drunk because that, that's cool. Like that, uh, that, like that song that Nate Dogg did back in the day at the end where he says, hey, 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 smoke weed every day. Like it's a damn public service announcement. Like, <laughs> like drink your milk every day. Smoke your weed every day. A reefer a day will keep the doctor away. What are the, what's another lesson? Always keep your gun on your hip. Always stay strapped and never be afraid to use your gun, especially if you're trying to kill another black man. What's another lesson? Oh, have sex with everything that moves. Now, we're not going to rap about wearing condoms, but we'll rap all day about how many holes I got. What, what, what else? Let's see. Another lesson. Well, be ignorant and be proud of it. Education's for suckers. What you doing? Acting white, trying to read and stuff. What's wrong with you? And then, oh, with money, don't be stupid and, and, and save and invest your money. No, don't, don't do that. No, you, you want to go to the club and pop bottles and, and throw your money in the air and buy a 50-pound diamond-encrusted necklace shaped like Mickey Mouse so you can just floss to all your friends. Like, I, I saw a, a cover on TMZ just two days ago with the rapper Fabulous saying that he spent $45,000 the night before in a nightclub popping bottles. I said, that's stupid. That's not something that you should be proud of. I said, I hope he saves all that liquor because he's going to need to drink his problems away when his dumb ass goes broke. <laughs> Number six, what's the next lesson? Prison, prison's nothing to be ashamed of. It, actually, prison is a badge of honor. You go to prison, that's how you keep it real. What else? Oh, and this is important. This is, you can't forget this lesson. You have to make sure you absorb this. Never under any circumstances ever show any respect whatsoever toward women, especially black women. You can use every word that you want to describe women, but you, you can't say anything respectful. Those are the lessons that you get on the radio every day sunk into your brain that you're repeating as mantras on a regular basis and nobody says anything about it. That's what these kids are absorbing. So when you look at this and you see these messages, can you really disconnect the messages that are being absorbed on a regular basis in pop culture by young people, young adults, et cetera? Can you disconnect that from rising HIV rates in the black community? I mean, can, can you disconnect that from the worsening graduation rates? The fact that handgun violence is the leading cause of death for black men in America, and most of the time that death, that murder, occurs at the hands of another black man. Can you disconnect that from the growth in mass incarceration? Because I, I'll tell you this, the biggest mistake that any person in America can make, black, white, or otherwise, is to walk away from education. But when I go into the hood, when I go to the school that my adopted kids went to, and I'm trying to talk to kids about this, it's like talking to a brick wall, because the, the good pastor, Little Wayne, has already sunk his message deeply into the minds of these kids, so they have to be deprogrammed. In a lot of cases, it does not work because basically every single day they've been fed a precise formula of self-destruction. They've been taught everything they need to know to destroy themselves. Now, I'm going to go into something that I notice we got a mixed audience here, and, and I, I want to I try to see if I can help you out a little bit. I'm, I'm going to teach you something about, about black people. We're going to call this Black People 101. Now, I've been a black man for quite a while now, and it's working out pretty good, so I'm going to stick with it. When you, which I, I see that there are students who do this, when you reach outside of other cultures and you try to learn about other people, namely black people, it's Black History Month, so we're going to talk about black people. If you want to learn about black people, here's what you should not do. Here is the way you do not want to learn about black people. Number one, you never want to learn about black people from what you see on TV especially BET, because we can't claim those black people. They from another planet, some of them. They, they were planted by the Illuminati. <laughs> another way you do not want to learn about black people is you don't want to talk to your one black friend and ask every question in the history of all Negro kind from that one friend. 
there is no one person that represents all of black America. There's 36 million of us. And so there's not one elected official that represents us all. I don't care what Al Sharpton tells you. <laughs> because you see, the thing is that if you look at media, you think that every black kid grows up singing, dancing, rapping, acting, blinging, balling, flossing, shining, stunting, or trying to make it rain on somebody. And I mean, I mean, really, it even goes to the top. Even the president and the first lady are on TV singing and dancing every week. And that trips me out. I'm like, is Obama trying to get a record deal? Or, like, what's the deal here? I mean, have you ever, think about this, have you ever seen any politician sing and dance that much? I'm not hating on the president, but damn, come on now. What's the deal? So these media images are not accurate reflections of who we are. We're every bit as diverse as everybody else, and I think most intelligent people understand that. And if you don't understand it, try to understand it a little more. So when you talk about this issue, and you talk about what's going on with hip hop, and we talk about the fact that something needs to change, it doesn't mean the genre needs to be killed, it doesn't mean that artists need to change who they are, but it does mean that maybe they need to slow their roll and take some accountability for some of the things that they say. Who do you, who do you, who do you approach? Who do you blame if you want to call it blaming? I don't like to use that word because it sounds like we're attacking the artist, and I'm not saying that. But who do you reach out to on this? I mean, do you reach out to that 16-year-old artist who's getting his first big break? That's not going to work. When you look at Soldier Boy, who's a, a young artist, who was effectively on TV thanking slave masters for bringing him to the United States because without slave masters, and I quote, I would not have all this ice. So he said, big ups to the slave masters. Do you blame the media outlets? Do you look at BET, for example, which I have passionately and, and I think I believe accurately referred to them as the new KKK? Do you reach out to BET and, 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 and challenge them and say, OK, look, we know that everybody likes some of these artists like Lil Wayne and, and Wiz Khalifa. And I don't like to pick on Lil Wayne, but you know, in, the, in China, they say that the fattest pig always gets slaughtered. So, so basically, maybe that's why I sound like such a hater on Lil Wayne. And I'm just jealous because all the girls like him and the girls never liked me when I was young. But do you challenge BET and say to them, look, you had your award show this year and you gave more award nominations to Lil Wayne than any other artist that you had on the docket. So what, what message are you sending to the community and to the public when you do that? What behavior are you reinforcing? Well, effectively, you're saying to every wannabe artist out here, every executive who's trying to sell records, that look, if you do what he does, we're going to reward you. Do more, not, don't just do what he does, do more of it, because we like that kind of stuff. And this guy, in his last album, is talking about killing little babies and old women and raping and murdering women and all these other things that a drug addict might say on a record. And you're not holding him accountable at all. Now, fine, if you want to acknowledge him as a celebrity, absolutely. If you want to say he's a great artist, fine. But do you have to exalt him as the example of what every artist should want to be? And so the analogy with BET and the KKK, was, it was extreme. I mean, I got some, some people that, that didn't like what I had to say. But I said, look, if I could name one thing that would make black that would improve black america the most and i had a choice between getting rid of the kkk and getting rid of bet getting rid of bet would take the cake so because the fact is this there's some 12 year old kid out there right now who has a future that could be anything we want it to be he's 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 innocent he's a good kid he's doing what he's supposed to do he wants to be somebody in this world but right now, that kid is putting down his textbook and flipping on the BET Awards. He sees Lil Wayne being honored by the adults around him, and, and, and he sees him being rewarded for a certain kind of behavior. He sees that Lil Wayne has money. He doesn't have money. Lil Wayne gets attention. Women love Lil Wayne. So why wouldn't he want to emulate that behavior? Why wouldn't he want to attend the church of Lil Wayne? And then, seven, eight years down the road, <clears throat> When he shot another black man in the head, or he's headed to prison, or he's uneducated, or he's infected many of his hoes with HIV, that blood is on your hands. You are responsible for this. 
You played a role in creating this person who has now turned himself into a menace to society. Because, you see, the thing about racism that's interesting to me is that racism is actually most effective when the racist has black skin. So racism runs across the board. It comes from black and white people and people of all ethnicities. Now, who else can you look at? Obviously, you have to go to the record labels, right? You know, when, <clears throat> when I grew up, and I'll tell you, this is, this is something that, that I think helps put this in context. My mother was young when she gave birth to me. My mother was so young, I, I think she and I went to elementary school together. So she was <clears throat> this young 16-year-old single mother, and, and, and I stumbled through school. I was a horrible student. I never would have gotten admitted to Brown. It, it, would, it wouldn't have happened. And I, but I got to college. I went to college because I didn't have anywhere else to go. And they said, well, what do you want to study? I said, well, I don't know. Well, what's finance? They said, well, that's money. I said, okay, I want to study that. Because I figured if I studied money and learned about money, somebody would pay me money to talk about money. So <clears throat> I kept studying money. I got my PhD in finance. And, and, and I learned capitalism. I know capitalism better than a man knows his ex-wife. I know how capitalism works. I know that capitalism is powerful. It's powerful like fire. Fire can either cook your food and keep you warm, or it can burn you and your family alive. Or like a drug, a drug can, can heal you and make you feel better, or it can turn you into an addict. I know that capitalism is a hungry beast with an insatiable appetite. It's never satisfied with how much money you made last quarter because the focal point is always growth. If you're not growing, what have you done for me lately does not matter. It's only what you're doing for me right now. I, that's how capitalism works. It never, ever stops eating. So this capitalist beast that is driving the commercialized, weaponized brainwashing of black children all across America obviously has to be dealt with. It obviously sees black America as kind of collateral damage. I don't think that they get up wanting to destroy the lives of so many millions of children. I, I don't think that's the goal. Their goal is to make money. If they could do it without destroying the children, then they would probably do that. But in a way, you could almost compare it to toxic waste. This transaction's happening where people are selling hip hop to each other and, and the waste is kind of dropping on our kids. Our kids aren't always the ones that go out and buy the records, and, 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 but they're the ones who absorb the messages. They're the ones who absorb the role models because they don't have a multitude of role models to choose from when they turn on the TV. And then you also have to look at capitalism because it's the capitalist executive who decides that we're gonna pick the most ignorant person in the room and give them the biggest microphone. And then when, when Tyrone makes that record and he wants to say something positive, no, we tell him, no, just throw in a few more bitches and hoes and, and, and talk about being from the hood and shooting people and, and that'll sell records. The fact of the matter is that we know that this genre has to be confronted. If you have the, have the interesting experience of being a black male in America, you understand the impact of these images. You understand the dehumanization of both black men and black women that comes from this genre. The fact that people somehow believe that black men, that we love our children less than other people, that we are a little less hardworking, that we have an appetite for criminal behavior, or that we love being uneducated. Now, you can't talk about hip hop without talking about all the systemic factors that come into play. You have to talk about what we have done as a society when it comes to the prison industrial complex, where we incarcerate 5.5 times more black men than South Africa did during the height of apartheid. You have to talk about dysfunctional school systems where kids are put in special education. I understand this because I was one of those kids. You're a black boy, you go in and you, you, you do something the teacher doesn't like and ne next thing you know, they, 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 they show your mother a fancy chart that says that somehow your son is not as smart as the other kids. That's what my mother went through because she was a poor single mother who couldn't necessarily fight the system. We also know that art imitates life. If you ask any rapper, they're gonna say, well, hey, yo, man, look, I just rap about what I see in the hood. And I understand that, I respect that, fine, whatever. But the problem, though, is that art and life are a recursive process. Art imitates life, life imitates art. When I look in the mirror, am, am, I, am I mimicking the person in the mirror or is the person in the mirror mimicking me? 
So when you get into this whole chicken or egg conversation and debate, we cannot leave the core issue. The core issue is that the problem has to be addressed. It is a social virus. It is a set of toxins that are entirely unacceptable. And if you want to know the way to confront this problem, obviously it doesn't start with the artists. It doesn't just stop with the media outlets. It doesn't just stop with the corporate executives. You have to attack all three. In fact, this reminds me so much of the 19th century when you had a huge opium problem in China. And it was an interesting relationship because you had the British making lots of money selling opium to the Chinese, and then you had the Chinese addicts who were happy to buy the opium. But then you had the people who said, no, we're going to burn down the opium houses, and we don't care what either of you think. And, the, and a war ensued because of that. But as a result, China became the powerhouse that it is today. And if that had not happened, then China would never have risen to what it is right now. So this whole idea that certain people shouldn't be held accountable because they're just following orders, I don't, I don't buy that. Nazi soldiers were just following orders. In the Penn State sex scandal, people were just following orders. If you go back to slavery and, and there's a revolt on the plantation, the, the, the slaves standing in front of the master's house trying to protect the master from the revolt was just following orders. But unfortunately, you had to say to that slave, look, we don't want to hurt you. You need to move. And if you don't move, we're going to have to take you out for the greater good. And the same thing is true for these hip hop artists, because the same people that don't want to take accountability for their words are glad to take the rewards and accolades that come with those words. They are paid millions of dollars for those words. So how can you expect to be rewarded for something when you are not willing to be accountable for the thing for which you're being rewarded? I mean, at that point, you start sounding like a Wall Street banker. That's why our economy screwed up. It was because on Wall Street, you had a mentality that says, look, we can take all these risks, and if it works out, we get the reward. But if it doesn't work out, we're going to get bailed out. Heads I win, tails you lose. When I talk to my kids, and, and they want to be grown when it's time for them to make their own decisions. They want to be adults. They want to be independent. But then when those decisions go wrong, they're like, oh, well, I'm just daddy's little girl. No, you're not. You're going you're to handle that. So for anybody who understands where I'm coming from, anybody who agrees on this issue, anybody who sees what I'm trying to say here and agrees with me that this problem has to be addressed, I encourage you to never underestimate your power to make a difference. You don't have to change the whole world. That's a big job. But you can certainly change your world. You can certainly pass a message that will be empowering for people. The most inspirational example I can think of in hip hop were those women down at Spelman College several years ago who told Nelly, look, you have a video, man, where you are swiping a credit card through a woman's butt. That is so degrading. That is so disrespectful. And you are not going to bring that trash to our campus. And you know what happened? Nelly's crew buckled and they crawled away and they haven't swiped a credit card through a woman's butt since. So the fact of the matter is that all of us have power on this issue, and the reality is that hip hop must turn the corner, and it's up to us to make that happen. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to um, thank Brown University for inviting us here to this wonderful uh, forum and to engage in um, a serious and civil dialogue about important matters that certainly have consequence in our national lives. Um, I taught here at Brown from 92 to 94, so this is a homecoming again for me. And it's always good to be back here. Uh, my very dear friend, Ruth Simmons, of course, is the president here. And I know she has announced that she is leaving. And uh, she is an incredible leader and a wonderful friend. And I know you shall miss her tremendous brilliance here as well. Shout out my very dear friend, uh, Trisha Rose, who teaches here. Uh, at Brown, you are 
uh, most favored to have a woman of her brilliance in your midst, and I know that she continues to speak intelligently uh, to issues and matters like the one we address here today. And I do believe that um, the renowned and legendary critic Greg Tate is teaching a class here. Uh, I don't know if uh, Mr. Professor Tate is here today, but uh, a remarkable critic and a soulful scholar as well. Um, we were, we being Professor James Peterson and, uh, and I, he's here, he's a director of Africana Studies at um, Lehigh University, uh, a brilliant uh, hip hop scholar who could uh, as easily speak about these issues as I can. We were speaking today at the prison um, over here at the Detention Center for Young People, and ironically enough, we were addressing these very same issues, so I appreciate his presence here today to engage in conversation. And finally, uh, Professor Boyce Watkins is a real, um, a real power and a real force, and I must admit, I turn to his um, website each morning to get my news. Uh, I, I shouldn't, I guess I should be saying I turn to MSNBC and I turn to other places, but I go to your black world and I figure out what's happening. And um, he always has provocative, insightful stuff that um, I didn't know about on that website and uh, very smart and sharp analysis, as you saw from his quite riveting presentation here today. So uh, it's an honor to be on the panel uh, with a gifted scholar like him. It would be hard to argue with anything he said to begin with. Um, the landscape, as Professor Watkins has expressed it, is pretty bleak. When we look at many of the problems that confront uh, young people in this culture, there is little denying that there is chaos at every turn. And on top of that, that the culture that has most symbolically gained visibility in American society in representation of young black people certainly reflects many of the problems that Professor Watkins spoke of. So, it would do no good to deny that uh, the pathology, the drudgery, the misery, the grief, the angst, the misogyny, the sexism, though he didn't mention it uh, because we don't have time to mention everything, the homophobia, uh, the class, grievances, and so many more issues are both consciously and unconsciously reflected within the realm of hip hop culture. So if the argument was going to be whether or not all the stuff that Professor Watkins so ably um, art articulated and insightfully identified um, were absent from hip hop, the argument would end. They're there and more, more than he and I can cumulatively express here today. But when we look at the question before us, should hip hop, should artists be accountable for their words, I think we can speak about accountability in very serious terms while acknowledging all of the critiques that Professor Watkins expressed here today, and still not throw the baby out with the bathwater. There is little question that the vicious misogyny and the virulent sexism and the incredibly hostile homophobia um, that we have come to hear in hip hop uh, continue nearly unabated in their lethal ferocity and in their vicious particularity when directed toward vulnerable bodies and vulnerable ears 
of young people. Young impressionable minds are being shaped by ideas and concepts that flow from within the realm of hip hop culture. And yet I would dare argue that were hip hop not to exist, all the problems that young black people in particular and young people more generally face would persist. Rates of HIV, forms of gender depression, vicious homophobia, the intransigent and recalcitrant prospect of women's rights being denied, the arthritic refusal of our culture to acknowledge the worth of women. The reason I know that would persist, or at least I feel confident in saying so, because all that stuff existed before hip hop ever came into existence. There's little denying, however, simultaneously, if we can make the argument that hip hop has glamorized and glorified many of the problems to which Professor Watkins has pointed and others that we might also add to the list. But to find a causal relationship between one and the other, a kind of human causality between the existence of fact A and the existence of fact B is a bit more troubled and, I think, difficult. Were that to be the case, if there were a one-to-one -one correlation between phenomena, such as artistic expression of an idea and its subsequent embrace in the culture, and the particularly interesting ramifications to which we could point as a result of that, then a whole bunch more people would be rich. Because the endless discussion of bling and hip hop and materialism is there, but most of those folk are just renting. They don't own. They're renting the cars, they're renting the bling, they're even renting for a time the uh, women in the videos who appear there. These are not their girlfriends. This is not their bling and these ain't their cars. So if the expression of correlation, the human causality between fact A and fact B were to exist, then we'd have to be more stringent in our philosophical argument about the relationship between hip hop culture and the negative pathological expressions that we see. Is there glorification and glamorization? Without question. Are, are there some moments of causation, particular species of negativity to which we could point that would suggest that their origin indicates that they did begin during the time of hip hop's birth and its subsequent rise to popular expression? Perhaps so. But for the deeply entrenched and profoundly rooted elements of social dysfunction to which we might point, those have little to do in their origin with hip hop culture, though they must be addressed in a very comprehensive fashion, as Professor Watkins spoke about, and it doesn't leave off the hook, by the way, the people who take advantage of those pathologies and those dysfunctions to make a living. And I'm not just speaking about Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum. <laughs> or the Catholic Church. Or the Baptist Church. Or institutions of higher education. All of which, by the way, participate with nearly palpable fury in the exploitation of and the gross misrepresentation of people of color, women, gays and lesbians, and others. Now, I am not trying to assert a, an equality of expression nor a functional equivalence between the vicious mischaracterization of minorities within hip hop, sexual minorities, ethnic minorities, gender minorities within hip hop, and the manifestation of such traumas in the broader American landscape. What I'm trying to suggest, however, is that the unyielding relationship, the lock and key relationship of causality between one and the other has to be troubled. It is not to avoid responsibility, it is to assign the appropriate measure of responsibility and accountability to hip hop artists who engage in their craft. 
So very easily I can answer the question, should artists be accountable for their words? Absolutely. And not just hip-hop artists, but all artists. Of course, hip-hop uh, has garnered such incredible controversy because of its hypervisibility. And its hypervisibility is rooted in the suspicion and skepticism in America about the fundamental place and priority of black life to begin with. Our skepticism about the place and priority of black life to begin with. And furthermore, the status of African American intelligence and humanity in the face of a culture that has been fundamentally inimical and hostile to black humanity and intelligence. Long before hip hop, Snoop Dogg was not the reason that a lot of folk didn't think black folk were human. Little Wayne, and I love uh, Professor Watkins. Uh, uh, brilliant engagement with Little Wayne, or with uh, Soldier Boy, bless his heart. <laughs> I mean, there are magnitudes of difference, however, between Soldier Boy and Little Wayne. Little Wayne is a rhetorical genius of incredible imaginative powers. That doesn't mean that there's not pathology and dysfunction in the midst. Doesn't mean that there are not hostile expressions toward women and other vulnerable peoples that need to be articulated, expressed, identified, and resisted. But, but to mistake Little Wayne, who moves like a silent G as in lasagna, he says, <laughs> and the kind of incredible fertility of mind that gives rise to queries, questions, wordplay, rhetorical facility, verbal invention, and intellectual creativity is a magnitude of difference than, say, Soldier Boy with Superman that hoe. <laughs> I'd rather be underground pushing flowers than in the pen sharing showers. Little Wayne says, that is an interesting couplet because it gives rise to the post-industrial incarceration of African-American and Latino men disproportionately that Professor Watkins has spoken about. That incarceration cannot in any stretch of the imagination be ascribed to the preoccupation within rap lyrics and the glorification of prison as the locus classicus, classes, locus classicus for the development, the, the, the primary spot for the development of black identity, as the ideal spot within which blackness can be located. Maybe the argument should be the reason prison becomes such an imaginative spot within the context of African American rhetoric is because it has been thrust upon black men as an unavoidable feature of their existence. So maybe the causality works in reverse in a kind of Kantian sense, we make a virtue out of necessity. Making a virtue out of necessity means, since it's going to happen anyway, I might as well extract some good from the situation. Or as Pee Wee Herman would say, I meant to do that. <laughs> and so the preoccupation with prison, the romantic and, if you will, idealized notions of prison, certainly which are self-destructive, certainly exacerbate already existing conditions, pre-existing conditions that are fundamentally profoundly problematic and that should be resisted when their glorification and glamorization is put forth within hip hop as a normative status of behavior and belief? Ain't no question about that. But it ain't started in hip hop. Hip hop is grappling with as best it can, as best it can, the profound devaluing of black life that is manifest in a prison industrial complex that Professor Peterson and I just witnessed up close again. And the private contracts that are deeply inscribed within the narratives of imprisonment for African American and Latino people in this society, the outsourcing of resources, the outsourcing of labor, the outsourcing of tremendous capital for the purposes of reinforcing hegemony and dominance over the lives of vulnerable black and Latino people. Read Michelle Alexander's book about the new Jim Crow for reference. 
So should artists be accountable for the glamour and glory they lend prison? Of course. But to ask the question that way in a one-to-one -one relationship, cut down on the number of references to prison in your lyrics misses the point. Begin to challenge the function and status of prison in the general existence of black people. Then perhaps the preoccupation with the glamour and glory lent to prison will subsequently diminish. So the relationship there of causality is not one that is sparked by the assertion within hip hop that prison is a good place to be. We then began to be a bit more sophisticated, looking at the causes that reinforce black vulnerability and imprisonment, Latino vulnerability and imprisonment, and how those are handled within the context of hip hop culture. And hip hop, by the way, hasn't been simply about glamorizing and glorifying prison. It's also been about pointing out the vicious consequences of police brutality. Fuck the police coming straight from the underground. A young nigga got it bad because I'm brown and not the other color. So police think they have the authority to kill a minority. Fuck that because I'm not the one for a punk motherfucker with the badge and the gun to be beaten on and thrown in jail. We can go toe to toe in the middle of a cell. Fucking with me because I'm a teenager with a little bit of gold and a pager searching my car looking for the product thinking every nigga is selling narcotic. Though old, Late 80s, early 90s, though recalling Jerry Curls and L.A. Raider hats. Oh, Ice Cube, your evolution has been remarkable. <laughs> In that particular pericope, that passage of scripture within the larger Bible of hip hop, what we began to see of course, is the demonization of young black vulnerable men, the ways in which their responses can be measured as an index of that vulnerability and their refusal to lose all agency, even if parts of that agency are expressed in self-destructive fashion and in ways that begin to demonize other young black men. And so when we look at prison, prison ain't being made worse because some rappers are talking about it as silly and idiotic, as inane and ill-intentioned as that may be. And yes, maybe for some who are vulnerable who will hear their favorite rapper talking about prison, they may be inspired to believe that prison is the place. That, I think, Professor Watkins is absolutely right about, and we must point this out to our children, not by censoring the artist, but by informing the listener so that the listener begins to make a choice with his or her pocketbook and ears. I'm not going to download that. I'm not going to buy that. And when I hear that, it's just nonsense. Or entertainment, the same way we look at Scorsese or Schwarzenegger, or Pacino. Say hello to my little friend, deeply inscribed in the narratives of hip hop culture. Why is it that filmmakers seem to have so much more grace and aplomb, so much more rhetorical facility, so much more artistic room to paint powerfully complex portraits of life that don't get charged with either nihilism on the one hand or a repudiation of the humanity of others while examining in toto the full sweep of social trauma to which vulnerable minorities are heir. How come they get a chance to do that? A film is deeper than a three and a half minute song, but songs are made on albums. So when we see The Godfather and the opening lines, I believe in America, America has made my fortune. And we see the story of a ethnic battle pitched against the context of American immigration policy and the way in which Eastern and Western European immigrants began to redefine the context of American life, which surely is the backdrop 
to the contemporary immigration debate when those immigrants are coming from Europe, they're seen differently than when they're coming from Central and South America. So one generation of immigrants are hating on another generation of immigrants. As a side note, no extra charge for that particular insight. And so the kind of artistic license that a Scorsese has, that a Francis Ford Coppola has, that a variety of American and other directors have, is the presumption of the presence of artistic merit to engage in complicated explorations of difficult questions with intelligence. And so when I began by talking about the lack of resp re respect for black intelligence, that's what I'm talking about. Because at the end of the day, you lose faith in young black people to be able to tell complicated stories and engage in more than merely realistic narratives about reality. What about the surrealism? What about the parody? What about the self-parody? What about, what about the self-critique? What about the fantasy? What about the perverse imaginings that are in American culture? Hunter Thompson and the ability of Johnny Depp to engage in drug adult fantasies that get played out as postmodern post-bourgeois preoccupations with the expansion of American identity through recreational drugs. Oh, it sounds so beautiful. As opposed to the pathology and nihilism of young black people who lack artistic merit sufficient enough to engage in the most profound reflections on identity. Now, to be sure, there are plenty of examples of the lack of that. Ain't nobody claiming that. But that's true in country music, too. It's true in opera. What is opera? Some stuff in a language you don't understand about basically incest and murder. <laughs> I know it's a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> Cantate domino. But, but the problem is that we do not presuppose the presence of sufficient artistic merit and intelligence and skill. So that when I taught a class on Jay-Z at Georgetown, people axing me. That's what black folk do, ask questions. And we get it right, it's not ask, it's ax. We're trying to cut to the heart of the matter. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, which is why we go to the lie buried. That's where the lies are buried. How dare you suggest that Jay-Z can be taught with Shakespeare or Chaucer or Homer? All right. Sorry, you mad. I just happen to think that's true. And I got a lot of evidence in terms of the rhetorical facility, in terms of the verbal invention, in terms of the preoccupation with a certain conception of the self narrated against the backdrop of philosophical arguments that may be more technically expressed elsewhere, but that have poetic expression within the context of his own language. Take, for instance, let, allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Hove, H to the O-V. Now, if you listen to that song, it's all kind of philosophical arguments up in there. You was who you was before you got here, player. You might change, but that's just the top layer. That's deep philosophical argument. That's some Derrida and Foucault meets up with Du Boisian conceptions of duality predicated upon a very sophisticated expression of a Marcy-like, Brooklyn-centric perspective. And, and, and I ain't just making that up. I'm saying read it for your damn self. So, I presuppose the existence of artistic merit so that I can engage in critique, which is an appreciation for both the presence of edifying elements that identify Jay-Z in a long lineage of creators who have a certain pedigree and the ability to call into question certain elements that are lacking that other elements of his work suggest are present, which therefore suggests that there is a fall off or a lack or by reference to issues that Professor Watkins has spoken about, teen pregnancy and HIV and 
misogyny. I mean, is anything too short and snooper doing? And too short is ridiculous. The abominable snowman melting in the heat of his own contradiction. I mean, trying to teach folk on a double XL, that is just beyond ridiculous. But that's, that's, not, that's an artist who happens to be doing something, but not in his song. He's doing that on a website for which the editor was rightly held accountable and too short should have been shamed, and he was and should be. But nothing matches what our conversation in the political world has talked about women this political season. Nothing done within hip hop can measure up against a bunch of old white guys in the Senate speaking about transvaginal amniocentesis, sound waves, and aspirin as a measure of birth control. Jiminy Cricket, <laughs> the lethal intensity of patriarchy is precisely more powerful because its nefarious ends are masked. Unlike with hip hop, whose vigilant ignorance is put on display for the world to see. And the accountability must be self-regulated as well as creating a community of interlocutors who engage in argument about the virtue of the art. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I have rarely seen an art form create so many communities of scholars, critics, haters, naysayers, and engaged persons as hip hop. I mean, people debate Mick Jagger. They debate Brian Wilson and the Beach, Bo the Beach Boys. Bob Dylan certainly is getting treated by the Oxford professor of poetry. But I mean, everyday people having an opinion about the answer my friend is blowing in the wind. They should. I have rarely seen the kind of vigorous engagement of the public about issues of critical importance and vital relevance to the lives of young people. So in contrast to others who are worried, I am encouraged by the fact that there's so much verbal, visible, audible in engagement with these ideas. The moment a too short pops up, people pounce. The moment some vicious expression arises, people are there to deconstruct, demythologize, and interrogate. Websites have proliferated. Young scholars who were children growing up under one golden age of hip hop now command a presence on the web, including Professor Watkins, who respond immediately. And so that responsibility is not seen in a vacuum. That accountability is enforced by the pressures of discourse brought to bear upon the practices of people. He mentioned a couple, Nellie vis-a-vis -vis the sisters at Spelman, too short in regard to the outrage that poured forth, and many other examples, of course, might be expressed. At the end of the day, Hip-hop culture is a vibrant, powerful, commercially laced and laden form of expression that expresses the worst and the best of what it means to be a fragile human being in the process of existential evolution in a culture that both supports and subverts our fundamental humanity and identity. And this is partly what it means to be black in the modern world, is to both be the object of desire and derision simultaneously. And so I think that artists should certainly be accountable 
words that are played to young kids. Parents should police them and artists themselves should be conscious of the consequence of their words. But as James Baldwin said, the burden of representation is especially acute on black people who are constantly in the air about our grievances because of the relative paucity of the flooding of the marketplace with our ideas in any way that might represent our control over them. We get certain areas that are flooded big time, hip hop, and Professor Watkins is right. A lot of the stuff we hear is whack and ill-informed and has no ultimately redeeming value and let a lot of stuff is going on that folk ain't even listening to. And especially the folk who say they don't want the negative don't support the positive. If we can, uh, you know, go by that bifurcated stratum, I, I can't do that. I think the bigger debate is between productive and non-productive, not positive versus negative, because you see people whose moral policing is predicated upon narrow heteronormative values believe it's negative to talk about sexuality and being gay. That's negative to evangelical Christians, so you can never escape the conundrum of and the canard of positive versus negative. I think that's narrow and dicey. It's got to be about productive and non-productive, edifying and uplifting in the most powerful sense of that word, not in one tailored toward the ethical demands of a narrow community. And as I end then, for me, that accountability that artists should bear is apparent. The first accountability is to make great art, not to be concerned about whether you're offending somebody. You offend me with mediocrity and whack acidness. <laughs> the first accountable measure is the measure of artistic excellence in the service of the truth that you desire to serve and to amplify. And then the accountability is toward communities of response that embrace your art and sometimes artists must be accountable for challenging their listeners. Art is not meant to coddle you and make you feel good. Sometimes the purpose of art is to make you awfully uncomfortable. And then finally, as I close, that accountability exists in a dynamic sense, constantly negotiating the contradictory and conflicting elements of our communal and political life as we give rise to new visions and possibilities in the intersection between art and reality. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move now to a uh, Q&A with both of our speakers. Can we get another hand for both of them, please? Thank you both. Um, so if you have questions that you want to ask, uh, there are mics there and there, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. A uh, few things that will make this go a little smoother is if I could ask all of you to uh, hold your responses and applause uh, until the end of the session. and. Um, to, when you're at the microphones, ask questions, please, uh, not just say things. So uh, we'll start over here. Uh, I don't know if this is on. Huh. Is this? Uh, thank yeah. you for a very oh, yeah. rich uh, exchange, gentlemen. Yeah. I, I just want to get your thoughts about two things uh, regarding this particular discussion. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Okay. Dyson, you know, the, the line that you quote from, from Lil Wayne, um, that I'd rather be pushing up flowers uh, than sharing showers, uh, is, oh, is antithetical to um, a line that we often quote from Tupac, right? Right. I'd rather be judged by 12 than carried by six. Right. And so I wonder if the two of you could reflect on that inversion and, I mean, has the prison industrial complex gotten that much worse over the course of Tupac's truncated career and Lil Wayne's career, or 
are they just do they just have different experiences and different opinions of it? And I think you both have spoken eloquently about the role of the prison industrial complex plays in it. Uh, then secondly, and I think this is this goes a little bit more to to the audience, and I think what young people are looking for out of discussions and discourses around hip hop culture is we're we're usually pretty good at pointing out what's wrong and what's negative in hip hop. Like we're quite good at at listing examples of people who we think are egregious or negative or misogynistic or consumeristic. And I wonder if both of you might offer up some more constructive, proactive examples. I mean, I could do that if you wanted me to, but I just want to say there are a lot of other artists out there um, that are doing things that um, already challenge and critique <coughs> the things and the artists that you guys are talking about that a lot of young folk listen to, but a lot of people who talk about hip hop culture in the public sphere don't often have any awareness of. So I wonder first if you could comment on what's going on with the prison industrial complex in terms of how those two different artists have an inverted sort of look at it. That's a little Wayne and Tupac. And then two, you know, um, can you talk to us a little bit about who you're listening to that is already engaged in the kind of critiques that you guys are talking about though on the artist side? You want me to? You go, yes sir. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will say that the artists that I appreciate the most, as far as commercialized artists, would be Lupe Fiasco. Um, I like the fact that he's kind of carved his own niche and walked away from the excessive materialism and, and just so many of these negative messages. I think that he uh, takes his opportunity to be a role model very seriously. Uh, I, I think that that, that whole uh, I'm not a role model thing, I guess it's your right to say that, but um, if you're part of that community, you, you simply cannot accept that. Uh, I, I think that when you talk about the prison industrial complex, uh, you know, what's so unfortunate is that prison has become such a serious reality for black men. My father was in prison. Uh, Professor Dyson has, 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 has some tough experiences in terms of dealing with the, the complex. Um, it's destroying black families all across America. And uh, one of the things I love the most uh, about what Tupac did was Tupac did something that I don't think Lil Wayne would do. You see, everybody wants to say, I am the next Tupac. And, and I think that, that Lil Wayne and T.I., for example, are as talented as Tupac. I don't believe in this idea of sort of elevating somebody because they're dead as sort of being untouchable. No, no, there are artists I believe that are as good as Tupac was. But one of the things I love that Tupac did that a lot of artists wouldn't do, I think T.I. might, he might do something like this at some point, was Tupac did a video in an interview where he said, I want to tell young brothers that prison is not glamorous, it's not a place you want to be, it's horrible. You know, I, and I like that, you know, and, and I, I really don't get that out of Lil Wayne, um, even though I think he's an incredibly talented artist. Uh, he, he's good. I, I know his songs because I listen to them and I like them. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, it's sort of like, you know, I like chocolate, but I know it makes me fat, you know? And, 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 and so, um, so uh, now to answer the last question, um, and I think I answered answer a little bit and I'll let Professor Dyson hit this, but um, I think that there are a lot of great artists that, uh, that you do have on the internet that are sort of in this underground circuit. And one of the biggest problems that we do have is that uh, corporate America has, has sort, of, sort of really reshaped the way media is delivered to people. I mean, if you go to any city in America, the urban channels kind of sound exactly the same because they're all owned by the same companies. And, uh, and, and so that has really created a space where uh, you're hearing the same artists over and over and over again. And I learned what kids are listening to by listening to what my kids are listening to. And, and they, you know, they know all the lyrics to all the same songs and all the songs are just whack and pathetic. So, um, so I, I think that there are some positive examples. Unfortunately, they don't get the same sort of backing that I think they deserve. Yeah, just to, to piggyback on that, uh, those great points and Professor Peterson's, uh, you know, uh, poignant uh, questions. Yeah, Pac said, I'd rather be uh, judged by 12 than carried by six go face a jury than, of course, be carried in a, in a, in a coffin. Um, there has been a reversal when Lil Wayne uh, talks about that, I think. Um, and uh, seeing uh, imprisonment in a way as a form of death, because uh, given what Professor Watkins just said in that interview that Pac did, of course, uh, that was seen in Tupac Versus, uh, where I had a chance to, uh, to come and comment as well. Um, Pac talks about, hey, all the time, you know, I heard prison was the place, you kind of elevated it, romanticized it, I get here, I can't write, I can't do anything, it just kills creativity. So uh, Lil Wayne, in one sense, is taking that to the next level. Uh, and the rapid proliferation of 
prisons, the prison industrial complex uh, that Angela Davis, uh, Joy James, and others have brilliantly written about, and now, of course, uh, Professor Michelle Alexander, just, just with a devastating critique of uh, the pervasive character of incarceration for young black and Latino kids. And you and I literally just came from prison before coming here. That's why we were a little bit late and we apologize. Uh, we were with, with a captive audience. And, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, what? Uh, <laughs> oh, don't imprison me with your thoughts. But, uh, you know, the, the thing is, we were spending time with young people over there, you know, who want to come to Brown some of whom have talent to come to Brown, some of whom are smart, but they don't have um, a chance for a variety of reasons, and they have been misled, and as Professor Watkins has talked about, the kind of utter romanticization of prison, and we spoke directly to that. The woman who brought us in wanted us to speak directly to that, whether Rick Ross or Little Boosie. We spoke directly to that. This ain't the place, because we coming in here and we're leaving, and you can't. And it's vicious. My brother's been in prison for 22 years now. I know the ins and outs of that place. But I know that he was reared when hip hop was not popular. And I know that the prison industrial complex does not rest upon the success of hip hop. Uh, hip hop can reinforce elements of it. The fetishization and romanticization and idealization of a certain kind of imprisonment as this you know, spot in space for critical reflection was wiped away by Tupac and obliterated by Lil Wayne. So I think there is a reversal. I think there's an acknowledgement of that the, both the empirical and existential dimensions of imprisonment and the narratives, the stories, when people return talking about that is not the place and let's get the heck up out of there. Uh, although it's in inverse proportion to a lot of the romance that we still see going on in a lot of hip hop lyrics. Now to answer your second question, and you're the perfect person to answer this, but um, you know, learning from you and other younger uh, people who listen to hip hop, there are a lot of people, Professor Watkins talked about Lupe Fiasco and he and I did a similar thing at uh, Drexel University in Philadelphia. He then came to my class at Georgetown uh, last year and closed it out, did a brilliant job. And then we had him on the radio, uh, an incredible artist. Um, I think uh, Kendrick Lamar with Section 80 is a tremendous uh, underground artist who's doing brilliant work. Uh, listen to Keisha's song to talk about some of the complicated realities the young women face. Um, listen to Elzai and Elmatic, a remaking of Nas's Illmatic from the perspective of Detroit, and I'm from Detroit. So naturally, I think it's a work of sheer brilliance. Um, but he's an incredible artist who worked with uh, Slum Village and if you remember and recall uh, Jay Dilla and uh, the like, these are just incredible artists. Um, I think Rhapsody was one of uh, Ninth Wonders artists. Jean, Jean, Grey, Jean Grey, who's another uh, artist who doesn't get uh, the kind of recognition she deserves, and on and on. And these are young people who are doing brilliant work that deserve to be uh, listened to and engaged. And as Professor Peterson says, makes, uh, they make a lot of the critique that Professor Watkins and I are offering here today. I mean, we can go back to, you know, I often quote the um, uh, Talib Kweli, these cats drink champagne, toast death and pain like slaves on the ship bragging about who got the flyest chain. We can listen to the early and late, listen to the new, listen to the new, what's uh, most Def calling himself now? Yasin Bey. Yasin Bey. Listen to his remake of Niggas in Paris. Right, what's the, what's the name of it? Poor? Poor in Paris. Poor in Paris? Niggas in Paris. In Paris, in Paris. A brilliant, a brilliant reworking of Niggas in Paris. And by the way, Niggas in Paris is a great song. And by the way, Watch the Throne was a great album. And by the way, above ground commercial artists who are making a lot of money, if you, if you look at that album, if you listen to it, it's an extraordinarily complicated narrative that can never simply be dismissed as too hyper-materialistic and consumers, although it's all that. But it's a lot more. And if you dare to listen to it and engage it, I mean, from, from murder to excellence, 
I mean, is one of the most remarkable songs in the consciousness of people on Top 40 Radio that an underground artist might not ever have the opportunity to make and be heard. Listen to, to Jay-Z asking why, querying why, in the MoMA, they only have white women and not women of color. I mean, there, there are so many more examples of that strewn throughout that album. So I think those are some of the artists that I would point to who do uh, incredibly important work that needs to be uh, listened to. Um, uh, uh, Professor uh, Michael Eric Dice, I think that was a great critique, of, especially about uh, Kendrick Lamar's album, Section 80. I love that album. Mm -hmm. um, but my question is directed to Dr. Boyce Watkins. Um, I, I, it's well understood and um, it's publicized your uh, distaste for BET, but um, I want to understand it's rather than just completely get rid of BET or just do away with it, what are your solutions for BET? Because I was that 12 year old at one point who came home from school and was able to put down my books to watch BET Rap City, but then at the same time, understand this is all fantasy and you know all of this misogyny is not something positive and not something that I want to live my life or base my life around. So, I mean, I, I understand, you know, people have their views and opinions about BT, but I also see there's a lot of value in what BT does, and especially in portraying blacks, not necessarily always in a negative light, but also in positive lights. And there are very positive things going on with BT, and I have noticed a change and shift in the culture of BT, and not just the artists that they portray, but also bring, bring pol um, political consciousness to light and also trying to educate our brothers and sisters. So, I mean, what are your solutions rather than just getting rid of BT? Because it also employs a lot of brothers and sisters who don't have a chance to, to work in the industry. Right, well, first of all, I'll say that um, I'm the first to admit that I'm, I'm, I've been very angry at BET for a long time because I think that, uh, that Bob Johnson had a great opportunity to do some good things. And because he was a hardcore capitalist that felt that the bottom line was the only thing that mattered, he created a, a whole generation of, of kids that are quicker to go shake their booty at the club than they ought to actually want to do anything productive. It doesn't mean that that's, that defines the whole generation. We know that. Um, I have kids in that generation, and they, and, and they don't, they, that, that's not who they are. Uh, they go to college, they, they're productive people for the most part, but there are some influences there that uh, affected millions of our kids. And, and I think that that simply can't be denied. I, I, so much of the damage of BET has, has been done in the past. Uh, I do see BET trying to redeem itself. And part of the reason that I think that, uh, even though I, I shit, I, excuse my friends, I, I think I've probably been banned from BET. They'll probably never invite me back for anything. But I feel that the sacrifice is worth it because I feel that those sorts of critiques, those punch you in the face critiques, are what causes them to become self-conscious and they backpedal and you see them modify their behavior because they want to prove people like me wrong and i love that even if you never ever you know reward me for what i say to you the fact that you're 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 adjusting is a good thing so you do see bet becoming a better network but the problem though is that when you start making your money in a certain way it's very difficult to start making your money in a different way it's like if you go out and you become a public figure. If you go out like uh, Britney Spears and, and, and brand and market yourself as the good little innocent little virgin, you can't just suddenly turn into a vixen overnight and expect your fans to understand that, right? So BET built itself in a certain way and there, there are some sins that BET has committed over the last 20, 30 years that simply cannot be corrected. They can't be redeemed. So, uh, and, and Sheila Johnson, the co-founder of BET, Bob's wife admitted that she feels that BET and the, the glorification of irresponsible sexual behavior, et cetera, played a role in the increase in the HIV rate in the black community. Anybody who spends a lot of time around black people, and I'm not disagreeing with anybody who disagrees with me, I'm simply giving a perspective. Anybody who spends time in the community knows that hip hop is it's more than just a, um, an art form. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a little bit more than going to see a movie. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, 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 there, there's, something about, there's something about hip hop that really sort of says that it's, it's important that the artist keeps it real. Like when Lil Wayne says, my flag is red, he can't just say that and then not, not be a, a true blood because he will get killed for that, right? So uh, in Vanilla Ice, he, he was a great artist, but remember what happened to him? When they found out that he wasn't really who he was, he was gone. So my point is, so, so going back to, to what you were saying, focusing on BET, um, 
I know BET is not going to disappear. Uh, I hope they continue to improve. What I really want to see, though, more so than seeing BET change, is to see a diversity of images for black children so that every intelligent black man I know who's fighting for airtime on television or whatever the case may be doesn't feel that their airtime gets sucked up because every network wants to put Flavor Flav on or, or those black men that fit these stereotypical images. Yeah, isn't that a critique more so of just the entertainment industry or media platforms in general rather than just focusing on BET? Right, BET you know? takes a lot, of, a lot of weight. They get a lot of heat because for a long time that was our primary option. Okay. You know, just like uh, I was listening to this song, uh, My Shoulder Lean, and he was talking about BET's my channel, right? So basically, you know, for a lot of black folks, BET was the main mm -hmm. avenue for us to see people who look like ourselves. And we took pride in BET because it was owned by people who looked like us. And unfortunately, it was owned by a slumlord rather than somebody who actually cared about the progress of the community. And that bothers me. I don't care if you make a billion dollars. You, if, you, if you cost the community 10 billion and lost productivity, then, uh, then, then we've lost while you might have won. Hmm. Hello. Hi. Thanks for your frankness uh, on the topic. It was really great. Uh, my question is about politics and the relationship between hip hop and politics, and in particularly uh, the, the controversy between Cornel West and Melissa Harris Perry um, r r recently, which got a lot of play, and, and also Dr. Watkins, your, your sort of intervention in that situation. So I want to know. Um, in what ways are public intellectuals also um, responsible um, or accountable uh, for their, their own language and their own words and rhetoric uh, with, with, within the public sphere? Um, because it seems that there's also this sort of, it seems that it's kind of symptomatic or, or reifying this sort of critique that we have um, with hip hop as well, uh, particularly in terms of black male female relations. All right, all right, all you right. Involved, I, <laughs> I, I didn't think anybody read that article. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, to what extent are we accountable for what we say? Is that, is that the gist of the mm -hmm. question? That's I can't speak yeah. for everybody, but I take full accountability, or, or full, I, I, I am fully accountable for every single thing I've ever said my entire life, even if I said something stupid. If you point out something, a brother today, actually, I ran into a guy who was a, uh, a, a, uh, in the PhD program here, who said that he was the brother of a, of a uh, scholar at UCLA who wrote an article about me today where he said that I used some language that was not appropriate and that I, I, I said something that uh, was, was problematic. And I read it and I said, I didn't say this. There's no way I said this. You know, I, it doesn't even sound like me. I know me pretty well and I wouldn't say that. So I'm mad I emailed the guy, you know, I'm, I'm emailing him like an angry baby's mama. You know, I, I was like, wait, wait, how can you say this? You know, I didn't say this. this you're making this up. And he said, so are you trying to say that you, you didn't say this on this video? And I, I, I paused. I said, oh, crap, maybe I did. So I went back. I watched the video, and I said what he said that I said. And it was a while back. I'd forgotten I said it. And then I said, you know, I will tell you that, um, A, I didn't intend it in the way you interpreted it. However, I can see why you would interpret it that way, and I'm very sorry. I take responsibility. And I, if I could say it again, I wouldn't say it that way. So I think that that accountability is important uh, because a lot of times you see people that uh, somehow become so deeply entrenched in their positions that they don't want to admit when they're wrong. They think that they're always the professor and never the student. And I think that uh, if you think that your job is to always teach other people and educate other people, but you're not being educated yourself, then you're missing 90% of, of the game. Um, you know, that's a brilliant question, actually, <laughs> about uh, <laughs> about, and, it, and, it, and then you see us equivocating and hemming and hawing, and, uh, but what had happened was uh, when we're so apodictic and absolute about the rapper, but when it comes to the pundit rapper and the intellectual rapper and the political intellectual rapper and the public intellectual rapper, and you're sitting, I'm sitting next to one of the uh, most gifted and visible uh, young public intellectuals in America. I must say though, um, and when we talk about Cornell West, we're talking about an iconic figure within American intellectual life. And uh, when we talk about Melissa Harris Perry, we're, we're talking arguably, arguably, about the most visible black female intellectual in America now. I mean, arguably, right? Um, so, you know, West is like our father. Uh, I'm the generation behind him. Melissa's the generation behind me. 
And I must say, I turned to, I told you, I wasn't joking, I turned to Professor Boyce Watkins and his site, and when she was announced as the uh, new host of her show, your website had five great reasons. Did you write that piece? Yeah, that was great. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> five great reasons why Melissa Harris Perry, she ever showed, I was like, wow, Boyce Watkins, I listened to this guy. And I, I checked it out, named them one, two, three, four, five. A week later, I'm looking at Professor Watkins and he's defending uh, West and he's coming hard, hard, Professor Watkins is at Melissa Harris Perry. Now she's a big woman, she can handle herself these are all big shots. Boyce Watkins, Melissa Harris Perry, um, Cornell West, these are big shots. These people have big platforms, big mouths, and the best sense of that word, big ability to talk with big words. And it's like that African proverb, when elephants are fighting, the grass suffers. I mean, I didn't get it right, but you know what I'm talking about. And, um, you know, I was, I was amazed. I said, I gotta ask Boyce, why did you turn around a week later and beat up on Melissa uh, in defense of, and I figured it was the, it, his, his tremendous fidelity to Cornell West is admirable. It is remarkable, and I, I give uh, Professor Watkins uh, much kudos for that, but Professor West is, has been very disappointing to me uh, in his comments about Melissa Harris Perry. Now, don't get it twisted, there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on behind the scene, and there's ugliness on all sides. Let me just say that. But uh, QD3 doesn't have to do a beef video only about hip hop. There's a lot of beef in the academy. We could have a forum next year. Public intellectuals and they beefs, <laughs> right? Not their beefs, they beefs, they beef. <laughs> right? And it's just as vicious as Nelly versus KRS-One, of Common versus Ice Cube, of 50 Cent versus Ja Rule, of Tupac versus Biggie. And it's even more vicious because y'all are supposed to know better. And it does throw in bold relief that all the stuff we intellectually at a distance talk about hip hop when we're doing the same thing in our own communities. I think when Professor West called Melissa Harris Perry a fake and a fraud, that is very dangerous discourse. As Professor Mark Sawyer, I think is his name, pointed out, the professor, the uh, head of African American studies at UCLA, and he talked about both, both sides. He talked about how Melissa might have been a bit more charitable in her engagement with Cornell and how Cornell was teetering toward, you know, saying, calling her dangerous as a traditional trope of sexist patriarchal surveillance of female existence. It's a great point. And I'm saying, you're saying you're about love and Dr. King, but Dr. King didn't call LBJ a cracker ass president. And yet you're calling a female intellectual who is your junior, former colleague, telling tales out of school. You're not supposed to talk about who voted for who in a tenure committee. That's unethical. And just because Cornell West did it doesn't mean it's right. It's a bad moment for him. He's a genius. He's an incredible human being. He's a remarkable man. And he's flawed in the way he talks about others' flaws, as we are all flawed. Part of it looks like hating on young people, seeing them rise in your shine. You say she's the darling of liberals when you wrote Race Matters, you were too. How you gonna, how you gonna say that? That can't be the issue. Disagree with her, because you have the rhetorical arsenal to do so. But I must tell you, if we're gonna be fully disclosing, Professor West was, I think, engaged to be here. You took his place. He withdrew when he found out I was here because he has a disagreement with me because I criticized him very briefly and gently in the public about his personal assaults upon President Obama. Now what is that about? We can't have civil discourse. You can talk to white supremacists, Rush Limbaugh uh, and others. I'm not saying he's a white supremacist necessarily. Uh, yes, he is. <laughs> you can speak to others, but you can't talk to me because you and I disagree about how you handled Obama. And I have criticized Obama, but not having a ticket to the inauguration, which then led Professor West to unfortunately, and I would have to say unfortunately, in his interview with Chris Hedges, say he wanted to slap Obama upside his head. I thought that was rough, I thought it was discourteous, and I thought it was disrespectful, and I thought it didn't betray, it, it betrayed the worst elements 
of Professor West's argument and nullified the brilliant critique that he had offered. But to withdraw from even this platform because of your inability, is a pattern. Melissa I'm Harris, sorry. Perry, then perhaps dealing with me as another younger scholar, ad hominem assaults versus substantive arguments. So I would say that yes, public intellectuals have a tremendous responsibility. We have enormous respect for Professor West. He has blazed paths and pioneered um, the way for so many of us. We want to call him to accountability as well in the reckless use of discourse in the public sphere that may betray a kind of politics unintentionally of envy when, of course, he would laugh at that because he's enjoyed enormous fame but at the same time, you can't be seen and positioned against the rise of another person and speak about her rise as being used by a liberal establishment, even if you have legitimate critiques of Melissa Harris Perry. So I think that yes, to answer your question, we are culpable, we are responsible, responsible we are accountable, and we're also hypocritical. Because we're making all these arguments about hip hop and ain't saying nothing about ourselves. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we are going to take all three of these last questions, but if we could move them a little bit more quickly, please. We're <laughs> almost out of time here. Thank you. That, that's my fault. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'll be accountable. <laughs> I wanted to thank you both for offering up both Lupe Fiasco and Kendrick Lamar as elements within hip hop that offer some, as uh, Professor um, uh, Dyson's um, said, not so much as in the positive or negative uh, binary, but in the constructive or uh, destructive um, sort of sphere. Um, but I wanted to sort of ask you both about if there's, you touched on this sort of this Du Boisian double consciousness that goes on. You know, we have um, artists who, like say a J. Cole or a Charles Gambino who college educated do um, um, have elements of a high-minded lyricism and genius behind what they say, but at the same time use elements of a more, shall we say, destructive uh, elements of hip-hop to get that ac across as well. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, you know, I, I think that many of the artists that, that we hear, e even those on the radio, are, are quite brilliant in their own way. Um, you know, I can easily, as a college professor, hear a guy who didn't graduate from high school, and I could tell that he is a, a scholar in his own way, um, and so or her own way. And uh, I, I think that <clears throat> you know what does kind of happen in hip hop, unfortunately, or, or commercialized hip hop, is you certainly see uh, elements of this hyper masculinity that ends up driving even those who uh, who don't have that intrinsically as a part of who they are. They sort of feel that that's that's kind of who you need to be in order to um, in order to uh, to to stake your claim and, and, and to territorialize yourself amongst other men, you know, to kind of sort of earn your right to be on the throne. And I um, and, 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 it, and it's problematic because uh, you see that you know even when you talk about artists that are, are trying to express something that 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 is um, that is intellectually enlightened, if you will, uh, it still has to come hard, you know, in many cases and. And, and you see this sort of spillover effect into, uh, in, into black America in terms of how black men interact with each other. I mean, it, it leads to that, that homophobia and it leads to um, it, the, the, just these instances of aggression where it's just not even necessary. Um, you know, it, what's so interesting about the calculus of being a black man in America, and hip hop's not responsible for this. I mean, hip hop is, is to some extent a product of this and it's glamorized this, but, and, and I think it has made the problem worse, but it didn't create the problem, we know that. But uh, the hard part about being a black man, I think, in America is that it's not just about you making the choices that are gonna lead to your success. Uh, you have to deal with, with the complications of what people around you are doing. Uh, if you're growing up in South Central Los Angeles and people talk about bullying and all this other stuff uh, is a suburban kind of issue and stuff like that. No, no, imagine being bullied by somebody who owns an AK-47, you know, who might kill you and your whole family because you said the wrong thing at school. That's what some kids are dealing with uh, in their day-to-day -day life. So um, ultimately, uh, I think this aggression is, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's naturally, instinctually part of us as men, but uh, certain environments, certain types of music, certain experiences can bring that out of you even more. And I've seen, literally, I've seen men who were nice, normal, kind, honest, good, caring people become something else because they felt like they needed to be that way in order to survive and thrive in their environment. 
and to be very, very brief, um, to piggyback on that, and people who are, quote, positive rappers, you know, also want to talk about love and making love. And people whose primary shtick is to talk about making love are socially conscious sometimes. It's a complicated world. Uh, and to ghettoize a particular artist uh, according to the major themes that he evokes or she uh, elicits in her art and addresses, and then as a result of that, to pigeonhole them may be more problematic than to see the complicated expression of identities within themselves mm -hmm. as an evolving artist. Common. You know, com I was, I was going to say common, <laughs> you, you know, and, and common. And a lot of the quote positive rappers who still use the N word or who talk about women in problematic ways, right? So, J. Cole is an extraordinarily well talented, uh, well gifted, uh, well spoken young man. St. John's University, the great books. Um, you, you know, I, I, I've met him and he talked about me coming to his university and him responding to certain lectures of mine, me talking to him, and so on and so forth. So I have respect for him, but at the same time, we understand, you know, as I do a lot of these artists that I've gotten a chance to interact with and talk to, and they're remarkably intelligent and lucid young people. Um, but, you know, life is complicated, and I think that, um, as Professor uh, Watkins talked about, some of it is the pressure of uh, conformity, the peer group that you identify coming hard in a certain way, or it could be the fact that this person went to college and they believe this stuff, and they believe the stuff they said, too, that's less savory. And this is what's difficult for us to, to both admire, which is understandable, or accept, which, you know, is part of the negotiation between an artist and his or her audience and responding to what they both demand and what they expect. And I think in that sense, uh, it's a bit more complicated than if you're going to be an edifying uh, artist, you know, one who's constructive and dealing and engaging in, you know, uh, very powerful ways of expression of self and culture and community, and at the same time, um, you know, dealing with the, the traps that one feels and the honesty that one might feel about one's relationship to women. You could be a socially conscientious person and still be mad at your girlfriend. Or you can be, you know, mad at your boyfriend. Or you could still be in a relationship of complicated, you know, character with people in your family and still bear the burden of revolution. So I think it's, it's a more complicated pattern than that, though it bears the elements of peer pressure and abdication uh, to a certain kind of narrow range of ideas that have been expressed in the culture that you feel if you're gonna be popular and successful, you have to respond to. Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Watkins. Um, you talk about Lil Wayne, uh, about him getting awards, and Lil Wayne is arguably an extreme. His appearance is taken to the extreme. His lyrics are as well. But arguably, he's, you said it yourself, he's a really smart person, are, as are many of uh, hip-hop artists. So I think maybe we should realize that Given that those people are smart, um, they know that at one point they just represent really self-depreciating humor, and they become parodies of themselves consciously. And uh, hip hop is just another subculture who is becoming a caricature of itself, and that has happened before to punk in the 70s. It happened to rock um, in the 80s, and maybe it's just happening to hip hop right now. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we should realize that it's just um, an inevitable path for every subculture to take. Um, and maybe there's, I mean, arguably there's really negative elements of it, like you said, but maybe we shouldn't be so alarmed about it. Um, Can you have a question, please? Hmm? Can, is there a question in there? That's, I'm, okay. I just want to get a comment on that. Mm. Okay. Um, well, uh, maybe some of it is inevitable. Uh, you know, maybe some of it's happened before. Um, I don't care. All I know is um, I, I see what I'm dealing with when I'm trying to mentor young boys who are being influenced by people who've also been influenced by what they hear on the radio. Remember, the, you know, many of these artists are, um, they really are, you know, pastors, and, and every kid in America goes to their church. Uh, if if, if, if Jay-Z or Lil Wayne starts dressing a certain way, they change how they dress. Uh, when they see Nicki Minaj, use a certain phrase on a regular basis, the kids start using that phrase. So to me, um, that might be true, but 
I feel when I look at these artists, I, I don't just see these, 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 these people from another place. I see my brothers and sisters. I see people that, uh, that I know. And I look to them and say, we need to get away from this temptation to absorb rampant, reckless capitalism and start at least considering a double bottom line. That doesn't mean that you have to stop doing what you do. You could probably do 90, Little Wayne even, could do 97% of everything he does and I probably wouldn't say much of anything. It's that last 3% where I'm saying, look, I, I, don't want you talk, I don't want you trying to prove how hard you are by saying you would shoot a three-year-old in the face because I know a three-year-old who got shot in the face. So, and so the, the truth is that everybody that, that most of us knows who sort of engages in that, that a certain lifestyle that you might hear about in music, many of those people sort of use hip hop as sort of a backdrop to their cultural norms. Um, the, the things they do every day are influenced by these artists. And, and I think that just in general, we cannot simply say that as long as you make enough money that any horrible thing you do is acceptable. And that's the problem we have in America at large, but in black America, it's especially bad. I'll just brief, very briefly add, I think her point is uh, very sophisticated. I think it takes account of the self parodic impulse of a culture. It judges the excesses rhetorically and musically of any evolving culture that has stratifications, differences, and the space demanded for self-expression, which is the first call of the artist, sometimes has to hibernate within those excesses in order to express itself against the dominance of a tradition from which it even emerges. And I think that's very uh, necessary to talk about. And I understand Professor Watkins in talking about the kind of empirical verification of the hurt and pain that we can see uh, in those cultures that may be encouraged in some of the music and I don't dismiss that at all, but I think that's a very sophisticated point that really has to be grappled with if we're gonna account for uh, modes and expressions of music and art and culture. Hi, I'm a grad student here at Brown in the um, Urban Education Policy Program, so my question is coming from the lens of believing that education should and could serve as a great equalizer in the vehicle for upward mobility, so my question is, um, and this is a question that I constantly grapple with considering that I'm going out into the education um, arena. How do we get minorities to buy into the concept of education, to regain faith in a system that has perpetually failed them and to find power in an institution that, inher that has inherently dismissed our identity and kind of also going against what is force fed through us through hip hop? Um, I would say that, first of all, I, I don't think that as a community that we have all just, or even the majority of us have walked away from the value and the importance of education. Um, I, I think that as a community, I think that we, what, I, I think everybody wants something. Everybody wants to be successful. Even that kid that grows up wanting money and power and fame and all that stuff, he, he, he naturally, instinctually wants those things because he's human, right? So to a point, so, so, the, the part of the issue is that when he grows up like any other kid and he's trying to figure out how to get those things, you're going to respond to what you see in front of you, what your friends are talking about, right? So you're more likely to see, your first images of other black men are more likely to be athletes and entertainers than doctors and lawyers and professors. And so what I find actually is that uh, when you talk about <clears throat> getting people to commit to a system that has continuously failed them, well, there are lots of systems that we're committed to that have failed us. Uh, if you look at the NCAA, the NCAA, exploits black men worse than any other system other than the prison industrial complex. They jack a billion dollars a year out of the black community and you see black kids spending eight hours a day on the basketball court hoping they can get a chance to play for some university that's gonna use them up, chew them up and spit them out, right? So, <clears throat> so it, it, but the reason that they're committed to the system is not necessarily because they're evaluating what the system can do uh, uh, you know, for them as a collective, they're saying, look, if I play basketball, I can be the man. I can make money like Jordan. I can get a big house, whatever. So when I come to them with education and I say, look, you're an athlete. You know how to work hard. You know how to practice every day. You know how to work and set goals and, 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 and commit yourself to something that you want to achieve in the long term. You know all that already. But let me tell you this. Education can do that much more readily than trying to get that one MBA contract out of a thousand people. 
And when you explain it that way, when you don't judge, you just say, look, I know as, as a fellow brother, I understand you know, that the money's not right and you want to make this right. You want to do things for your mother. I know that you want to be successful. You want to be the man, fine. Let me show you a lot of ways to be the man. And when you sort of plant that seed and explain it in that way, explain why they should want to be educated, and then explain why they actually can be educated, which involves a lot of deprogramming, you find that, that people naturally gravitate toward education. And because, in fact, the easiest thing to say to young guys that, because I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but when I go to the schools, you see so many black males that want to be athletes or entertainers. It's, it's all over the place. So I say, look, fine, okay, you want to be an athlete? I'm not even going to kill that dream. Let's just keep that on the table. But let me tell you this, even if you are an athlete in the NBA, if you are not educated, you will get pimped and punked and somebody's gonna take all your money. Let me tell you a story about Antoine Walker, who went through the University of Kentucky with me not knowing how to read, and never thought he needed to learn how to read because he could dribble a damn basketball. Antoine made $110 million, now he's broke. But guess what? His lawyer's not broke, his, his agent's not broke, all the people that worked with him along the way, his financial manager's not broke. So, if you want to have money, you want to have power, here are some other ways that you can have those things that go beyond just dribbling a basketball. So keep dribbling the basketball, but supplement that because nobody wants to go through life in America without being smart and prepared to succeed. So, so I think when you present the message in a way that makes sense, kids buy it. I didn't buy education as a high school kid because I couldn't see what it could really do for me, to be honest with you. Once I found out what it could do for me, you didn't have to preach to me no more. I did it myself. There you go. Yeah, I, I think uh, very briefly, um, Martin Luther King Jr. is a very educated man. He's got murdered for it, really. Malcolm X, extremely so. So I agree with everything Professor Watkins just said, and I heard Professor Peterson say it earlier at the prison, telling these young men to be educated more than the fact that you're going to, you know, uh, run a basketball or run a football or, or shoot a basketball through a hoop or be an entertainer. But Hortense Spillers said in her seminal essay on uh, black intellectuals that this is what the dominant culture asked of us, to be athletes and entertainers, so to speak, to do physically demanding work and to, uh, to entertain. And from slavery on, that has set the paradigm. The paradigm wasn't self-generated, it was a survival modality. So what's interesting is that we tell people about education, but we don't tell them the truth that you've confronted tremendous resistance at Syracuse. Yes. Not because you're dumb, but because it's precisely the opposite, because you're smart. Mm -hmm. That's right. And being smart has gotten a lot of people in trouble. So we lie to young people thinking that if we tell them, hey, don't try to be an athlete or an entertainer, because most of you can't do that anyway, uh, but do it this way, because this is the, the successful way. Ask a bunch of middle managers in America. Ask a bunch of people who've been educated what they've faced. Tremendous difficulty. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be educated, of course. In order to have that problem, you have to have a certain amount of luxury and skill. So I am suggesting that you get educated as well, but be consciously educated. Understand right. that, you know, they tell you in my generation, generation before mine and several others, you got to work twice as hard, get up earlier, be smarter than, but they forgot to tell you, there's a lot of resentment. <laughs> there's a lot of resistance. There's a lot of hatred because of that. We see it in the president. Look at Obama. Forget whether or not you agree with him or disagree with him, but just as a human being and a guy who did it the way it was supposed to be done. He ain't dribbling no basketball. He, you know, he's singing. I know uh, Professor Walk is mad. He's saying, I'm glad the brother's singing because uh, I'm, 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 I'm tired of hearing that horrible tune sung by the other side. So Sweet Home Chicago is good with me. And Al Green, without the grits, is beautiful as well. But. The, the thing is, is that he does it the way they say it should be done, and it's still not enough. He does it with aplomb, with skill, with grace, with intelligence, with oratorical flair. He does it with cool and dispassion. He does it with clinical distance from the problem. He does it with an investment, and it never makes the grade. So let's not lie about the function of that education and how young people notice that and peep that. They ain't stupid. They was like, look, dude, you got all that stuff and you getting this too. At least I control my destiny with X, Y, and Z. So let's not act as if this is not rational choice theory. The young people don't espy the tremendous contradictions that are inherent in a system that ostensibly rewards people for education but punishes them at the same time. Education is critical. What's being force fed to us, you say, through hip hop, what's being force fed through us through ideologies of containment 
that are expressly linked to certain forms of education are just as troubling. So I would say, um, obviously, we, we all got PhDs and we're serious about education. We teach at big time schools. The question is, to what degree are we willing to do a thorough examination about why some people get education, some people don't? Why some people think it's a way out and for others it's not? Why Deepa Pager from Princeton University in the Sociology Department can do a study saying you could be a black person with college education in New York and have less of a chance of getting a job than a white man who's a criminal and been to prison. Mm -hmm. There is, in a nutshell, the fierce contradictions that we also have to address as well. But education is critical and vital. Mm -hmm. Thank you to everyone who asked questions, and thank you again to both of our speakers. It's been fantastic.